So we're going to talk about risk of bias, and I'm going to set it up within the context of making sense of a meta-analysis. And basically what we're, our fundamental question is, are we looking at or finding evidence that we can really trust? So, what are we going to cover? What is meta-analysis? What's it good for and how far can you trust it? Assessing risk of bias in scientific articles, and then how to use the Cochrane risk of bias tool, or at least a modified version of it. So no doubt you've run across meta-analyses in your reading. Well, as a clinician, you might be thinking, well, how on earth might I use this to help my patients? In other words, so what? Well, I'm going to answer the so what question with two answers. First, you need to be able to understand what, what meta-analyses are telling you to determine whether they can mean anything for your patients. And second, uh, this is a tool that you can actually use in clinic. And seriously, I'm not even making that up. But rather than just tell you, it might make more sense if I show you. Let's start with a scenario. We've got a problem. Pharmacological treatments for serious mental illnesses commonly lead to weight gain, thus increasing the risk for comorbidities and non-adherence. And so our question would be, well, in patients being treated for uh, serious mental illnesses, do lifestyle weight loss treatments that include both nutritional and physical activity and components lead to better weight status outcomes and treatments as usual? Let's say that we did our literature search, identified 13 studies that compared a multi-component weight management program for people with serious mental illnesses to standard care, that is, you know, no weight management program. Taking change in BMI as our primary outcome of interest, we extracted the data and found that only two of the studies found a statistically greater improvement in BMI for multi-component weight management programs than standard care. Imagine that you were in charge of making the decision of whether or not to go to the work and expense of instituting a pro program of this sort in your clinic. Well, what would you decide? No, right? And on the face of it, that would seem to be the right decision. But guess what? It's actually the wrong decision. Were we to do a meta-analysis, what we would find is that only two studies found a significant difference between the treatment and the comparator. Notice that the whiskers don't cross the uh, line of no difference, that uh, horizontal black or vertical black line there. But when we combine the non-significant findings across many studies, we create a much more powerful picture of what's going on. Indeed, we see that across the studies, the lifestyle intervention resulted in an average of just about two BMI points lower than standard care. So what's the clinical significance here? Well, had we focused only on the number of significant articles, two out of three, what we call vote counting, we might conclude that it really wasn't worth doing anything different from what we were currently doing with these patients. However, because we were able to combine the data from many small studies, we're able to get a clearer picture of what the true difference really is. Only a two-point BMI difference, you say. Well, you know, I mean, for a six-foot male, that translates into just about 20 pounds. Now, I'm hoping you, or at least some of you, are, you know, like, wow, this can help me with my patients. And, you know, the rest of you, you know, go back to sleep. But even though meta-analyses can be a powerful clinical tool, here's a hard reality. The numbers are only as reliable as the research that went into them. So, basically, if you've got garbage coming in, garbage is going out. In other words, lumping together a bunch of unreliable data is only going to produce more unreliable data. But how can we tell how reliable a particular research, research article is? Well, we need to evaluate our, an article's risk of bias. So, we'll talk about that next.